Thanks so much. It's a privilege to be here today, and uh, I want to thank everybody out there who has come up to me and told me uh, today, hey, I'm praying for you. So appreciate your prayers. and know I'll need them a little bit So as we go through this. Um, before I get started, though, I'd like to, uh, if you can bow your heads, I'd just like to uh, dedicate this to the MSU victims, uh, both living and gone, and just take a minute, moment of silence to think about them for one second. Thank you. 2001, I said, uh, I thought about, okay, how do I begin this a little bit? You know, 2001, I'm at Promise Keepers down at Ohio State. I'm coaching at Ohio State, and I'm with my uh, um, distant relative on my wife's side, you know, but a good friend of mine. And uh, somebody's talking down there. There's 20,000 people listening to a, to a prayer, you know, prayer group and things of that nature. and. Uh, so I'm sitting up in the last row, I think, up in a suite, and my guy looks at me and he says, uh, that's gonna be you someday. I said, <laughs> I don't think so, Mike. I do not think so. Um, but uh, here I am today, I've done this a number of times, and um, so here I am today, and I'm gonna have to call Mike up as we, after I get done with this, and said, well, I spoke again. <laughs> so, but, uh, my clinic talks, when I talk about football or anything else, you know, I'm trying to uh, make it my goal to try and give people something to use or take with them, take home with them as they go. So hopefully you can take a little bit of something with you uh, from this talk and uh, take it home and maybe use it at, at some point in your life. And uh, so that's my goal. That is my goal. I, uh, I want to, uh, I, got, I get a booklet every month from uh, Gene Orlando, who is our tennis coach. And uh, it's called One Bread, One Body. So I read it, you know, I read the daily um, scripture of it, message. And so I came upon this um, on April 15th, which happened to be Easter Saturday. And I thought I should read this to you a little bit and because uh, it sort of speaks, speaks a little bit. You know, a lot of people think I'm coming to do this for you. I'm coming to do this for my soul as big as well. So it says, he will, also, he will send the Holy Spirit to put words in our mouths so we can witness. The Spirit will likewise convict of sin those who dis disbelieve our witness. Didn't think I was going to read that. Therefore, witnessing is one of the most powerful ways of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we witness to our faith in Jesus, we share the faith and grow in it ourselves. Witnessing glorifies the risen Jesus, builds kingdom of God, and hastens our growth in holiness. Witnessing for the risen Christ changes the culture of death into a civil civilization of, of life and love. And I thought that sort of says it all a little bit today for me, you know, an opportunity to come here and witness a little bit, talk about my faith, and, uh, and move us forward. Um, I brought my Bible today because I've got to use my coaching voice a little bit. So I've got to be firm, got to be a little bit bold as I go through this. So, you know, here we go. You know, I, I believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us uh, so that we could come to heaven. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, who sort of works his ways through everybody's soul here and helps bring us a little bit closer to God every single day. Those are the things I believe in, and I want to testify that today. Uh, my faith... You know, I sort of believe that we're all on different journeys with hopefully the same end result as we go forward. But people's faith, I think, is very, very personal to them and uh, private in some ways. Some, some ways it can get public. But uh, in a lot of ways, it's your, it's your spiritual journey. It's who you are. It's about you. So um, I don't judge people. I just know that when you get on fire a little bit for the Lord, you know, good things are going to happen for you. And that everybody has their own different time and place for doing these things. As a football program, my philosophy was formed by my experiences, really. All my experiences as a, as a coach really came through people I were around, the players, the coaches, all the different things. Same with my faith. 
Those experiences throughout my life, starting with my mom and my dad, certainly my wife at 33 years, my children, so many people here. Um, I'd like, by the way, before I forget this, I'd like anybody who talked to me about my faith, if you'll stand for one minute so we can recognize you. I don't know how many people would be here. I don't know if I can see you all. But if you'll stand, Lydia, stand up. <laughs> Philip, Phil. I think Scott Hayes might be here. Um, but I want to thank you personally for being a part of my growth as we move forward. Uh, teachers, priests, pastors, so many more have impacted me. Basically, from a football philosophy standpoint, there are five cornerstones that I sort of build our program on. And I think they sort of carry over with, uh, with my faith. I was going to put a time limit on this, but I thought, well, Phil, give me the <laughs> nice time. <laughs> Five cornerstones that I think dictate success can be used in, the, in your professions, I think in your marriage, um, in your faith, whatever you choose to, ch to do it in, I think these things are, uh, are uh, part of anything that, uh, that you're trying to relate to people. The first thing is you've got to have a sincere relationship with my players, as a football program, with your wife, or with your God, a personal relationship. So you've got to be able to communicate with that, with the people. You've got to ask yourself, and I'm talking about our faith here. You know, I had yearly player meetings, you know, that would last. I'd have 120 players. I'd have 10, 15 coaches. I've had various other people. I would meet at least a half hour with every person every year talk about their life a little bit, talk about their goals, talk about the different things they're trying to do. Same thing with, uh, with our faith. You've got to ask yourself how much you're communicating with the Lord. Is it daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Is it yearly? You know, where are you at in that process? Doesn't make, right or wrong doesn't make any difference. It's where you're at in the process, I think, as you move through things. But you've got to have communication. You've got to have a commitment. It's got to be commitment to, to your faith. What are you going to try and do? And it goes both ways, I feel. That, you know, are you following the playbook? Are you following the commandments, his teachings? You've got to have trust. Are you in his inner circle? Allows you to overcome adversity. Handle adversity, I think, is one of the biggest things, major obstacles that we go, go through. But the relationship part is key, very key, I think, to building any, any positive organization because Really, they don't know how much you care until they know how much you, they don't know how much you know until they know how much you care, and in so many different ways. The second cornerstone: knowledge, education, passion to learn. There have been so many people who have educated me along my path regarding my faith. When I start thinking about it, you know, my mom and my dad certainly they raised me in the Catholic faith, Catholic. Uh, they started the process. I really have never strayed away from my faith. Never really found that, that one day I just knew that I had it and that from day one that, uh, that I would be able to follow Jesus and his teachings. But then beyond that, there are so many people. My wife, 33 years, has been really my teacher, my prayer warrior in so many t ways. You know, I found a note, find notes from even now, I found a note. Uh, and one of the things I was looking through, I found a note from her from, I think it was 2006. So along the way, there would always be these little reminders and little notes of me to carry forward in my faith and am so strong in that way. I'm gonna talk about a couple people here that you don't probably know, but Jim Bowman. And you say, you know, you're on a different, everybody's on a different, you know, road. So I'm sitting there at Youngstown State, I'm uh, 28 years old or so, and you know, I was raised Catholic, and uh, Jim Bowman's talking to me, and uh, he starts talking about revelations. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Say that again. And so, you know, he took me through that. Pastor George Cooper, three things I learned. He, he, uh, he talked about, uh, you know, when I was there with Nick, Saving, you know, we'd have Catholic Mass, we'd have a non-denominational group meeting for chapel, and our players were very good about going to this. I started going to the Catholic Mass and then sort of transitioned over to the non-denominational, and I'd go there at the end, end of it and I'd listen, and uh, 
He was talking one day and he says, uh, Pastor George was there, there before Phil. He's one of our, our, our guys. And uh, he said, hey, write down three things that you would wish the Lord to give you. And so uh, I never did it. <laughs> Every time he'd come by my office and he'd say, Coach, you wrote those down? And I'd say, not yet, George. <laughs> Finally, I did. Finally, I did. And one of the things I can tell you was to sort of uh, allow me to have a bigger impact on his people. About two weeks later, three weeks later, I was hired as the defensive coordinator at Ohio State. And, you know, my career sort of took off. Beyond that, I became the head coach at Cincinnati, more impact. Beyond that, head coach at Michigan State, more impact, more group of people, more different people. So Pastor Cooper sort of started me on my way. Don Treadwell and Harlan Barnett, two prayer warriors, two assistant coaches who, who you know, shaped my life strong. Jim Tressel. First Bible study ever at, uh, at Ohio State. I was like, oh, I'm in a Bible study. How about this? I think I was 40 some years old, 45 years old, but, but uh, you know, I just found great comfort in that every Friday as I walked in there at 11 o'clock or so. Father Jake Folio, many of you might know. Father Joe Krupp, Phil Gillespie, Philip Rogers, all of those and more, Scott Hayes, had an impact in my life, my journey. Jake Johnson. Now, many people might not remember Jake Johnson. He was a coach down in Pickerington, Ohio. I'm on my flight to the Fiesta Bowl. I'd just been named the head coach at uh, Michigan State. And um, he walks up to me and he gives me this letter. And it's got, a, it's got one of those yellow, yellow pad notes on it, the letter, and it's uh, talks about the prayer of Jabez. How many people have ever heard of that? Quite a few of us. Talked about blessing me, enlarging my territory, being with me, keeping me from harm so that I can be free from pain. God granted him his requests. I can't tell you, and this is 20 years ago, 22 years ago, how many times I have read that. So there's been so many different people that uh, throughout my life that uh, have really been angels put there by God to help shape me in my, uh, in my um, journey, in my journey. Be a light, do for others. What would Jesus do? It's your turn to be that angel. Tom Izzo does it better than anybody that I know. Better than anybody I know. He makes it so easy to, uh, to do things for people so many different ways. And his spiritual world is much like the other people I was just talking about. Private but he's on his journey as well. Work. You know, as a coach, I worked an 80-hour work week, 85 maybe. Um, you know, it was constant. It was always something. You're never off when you're home. You got to work at your faith too. It just doesn't happen. I think you have to work at it. It has to be something daily. It has to be something that you continually sought, sought after, that are sought after. And remember that we're all sinners and we will sin again. I can promise you that. I think we're all examples of that, especially myself. But uh, work. One bread, one body. Again, reading something. It talked about, he's just talking about work. It was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians for the first time. It says, what does that God mean by the name Christian according to Acts? And this is all in Acts. So I won't, I won't preface everything. On, but to believe in Jesus and be converted to the Lord to repent and be baptized into Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to remain firm in our commitment to the Lord, to witness for Jesus, and to lead others to the Lord, to be taught intensively for a year or more about new life in Christ, to continue steadfastly in Christian communal life, to center our lives on breaking of the bread, to devote ourselves to praying together with other Christians, to be submissive to the authority of the church, and to suffer for the love of Jesus Christ. All of those things, I think, uh, takes work. It takes a commitment, as I said earlier. Psalm 91, you can't be afraid of the things in this world. You cannot be afraid. If you have never read Psalm 91, not feel the terror of night, nor the air of the, fl air of the flies in the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the plague that destroys at midday. 
I think I remember it this when I memorized it. I went through so many different things sometimes. A thousand may fall at one at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. But um, things like that, to me, you have to make a commitment to it and work towards it every single day. Football-wise, you know, we, uh, we always find a different way to do things. There were so many meetings and so many different things. But in the end, it came down to assessing, and I think it's the same with your faith. Assess. There was a, a general back in 1719 that believed in doing these things every single time that he had a, um, a battle or something like that or every, every daily thing. But I think it fell over to football. I think it falls into our faith aspect as well. You assess where you're at. Adjust, repent, but uh, you assess where you're at, you adjust, and you repeat over and over and over again. You keep throwing it up against the wall until it sticks, and that's sort of the way that we've gone about things. When I first got to Michigan State, I remembered the, uh, the uh, verse in Esther where it said, for such a time as this, and I tried to live that as I went forward over and over again. The last cornerstone is winning. As a football coach, it's winning. You either win or you're out. <laughs> you will be judged on your success, and I believe heaven is the end goal for all of us. And so that's what we're trying to get, and that's, that's, that's the aspect that you would say is winning to me. Tom Monahan, who I've gotten to know, you know, Domino's Pizza guy and owner of the Tigers, takes it one step, one step further in his book. His goal is to bring others to heaven. And I've really never heard about that before. You know, but, uh, you know, he does that, and I think that's, that's, that's to be commended. Like other things in life, winning takes conviction, a sense of purpose. It takes confidence. It takes knowledge. You got to handle adversity. You got to play or pray with passion. You got to have a plan. You got to have a belief in what you're doing. You know, David Fennell is a guy that uh, played for us. And David, uh, to paint the picture for you, David didn't play that much. He's recruited. He was from Oregon. I got to tell you, they don't play great football out in Oregon. <laughs> but anyway, we recruited David. And a great guy, great guy, good, good solid player, you know. But didn't play much. Had some problems with his feet. Had surgery. He was on a scooter for six months with one foot, and another six months with another. So, inevitably, you know, he had to take a medical red shirt, I think, and never really finished that aspect. But he graduated in, in engineering. And he walked up to me at the end, and I presented him with a certificate that, that he won at, uh, at graduation at the engineering department, and uh, he walked up to me and handed me this, this letter. I get a lot of letters. Um, and I thought, I thought, wow, you know, when I say I learn from our players, the things that you hear from your players sometimes are amazing. And really from day one, you know, the day one when I got to Michigan State, you know, Justin Kershaw walked up to me and said, you know, Coach, we could still say the word? And I'm like, remember, I'm on my journey. What word's that? And uh, you know, he talked about his faith a little bit and, uh, you know, getting together at the end of every practice and uh, as a group. I said, oh, absolutely. But anyway, David hands me this letter. And I think it, it says something today. And I want to end our t my talk again today with this. Tomorrow will not be different until you change today. Tomorrow will not be different until you change today, whether it's your faith or whatever else you're dealing with. It is the journey that makes you strong the journey that makes you strong. A man who is certain of his path pays no attention to the odds against him. So some of those things to me, all three of those things are life altering. And I've read this many, many times as I've gone and, uh, and talked to different people. So I want to thank you for giving your, me your time today. I hope I stayed under 20 minutes or so. Um, initially, they told me, well, we want you to speak for 45 minutes. And I was like, <laughs> I can't possibly speak for 45 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank everybody today. Again, I want to thank you for your prayers. Keep doing what you do. Keep impacting people and be a light for this community. Thanks and go green.
Wow, I gotta follow that. <laughs> Coach, thank you for sharing with us this morning. Um, thanks for being an authentic, humble example. I, when I think of Coach, I think of humility. Uh, 114 wins. Humble. Always seeking to give others the credit. Always looking to open doors for others. Uh, my wife, Julie, for years had the privilege of leading a coach's wife's Bible study. And if you ever really want to get to know a coach, just listen to the wives talk. <laughs> and what you have seen in coach's life is truly who he is as a person. And in a world that's so plastic, um, thank you for that. And thank you for the doors personally that you've opened up for me in our ministry at State so that so many people could hear about the good news of Jesus. So sincerely, thank you so much. Well, I want to come to a very important part of our program as we uh, near our close. Uh, just as Coach D provided opportunities for his players uh, to grow spiritually and to take the next step with God, the Michigan Prayer Breakfast Committee would like to offer you the opportunity to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now you heard Coach mention this thing about personal relationship. And depending on where you come from, some of us are familiar with that. Some of you out there may be, what in the heck is a personal relationship? Uh, any, any card collectors growing up? Baseball cards were my thing. I still got them all. Plastic sheets. So I've been a Detroit Tiger fan for years. The pain. Uh, there was a player, uh, my favorite player was Jason Thompson back in the 70s and still rocked my world when he was traded straight up for Al Collins, but that's a story for another day. But I can remember, you know, when you were a child, you had heroes, right? And, and so many people have coached Antonio as a hero. And uh, when you're a baseball card collector, you would look at the back of the card and you would see the stats and you would see the bio information and you would dream about meeting your hero. And I would play this scenario out in my mind. I'd meet Jason, right? And of course, Jason would want to hang with me. <laughs> He's not my friends, but me, he would want to hang with. And I'd play out the conversation. And, hey, Jason. Oh, Sally. How's your right arm that you throw with? You know, and, and I, would, I would play out stats to him. And, and I thought, wow, he would really want to be my friend. But if you're Jason Thompson, you would look at me and say, you know, you know stats and facts about me. <laughs> Who are you? You, you? you don't know me. You just know stuff about me. And in my 23 years at Michigan State and, and sharing the good news of Jesus with athletes and coaches, a common mistake is confusing. If I know facts about God, I must really know God personally. But they're very, very different. And so... I just wanted to give you the opportunity. If you don't know if you're in a personal relationship with God or what that is, just want to tell you what the Bible says about that. There's four things the Bible says. The first is some awesome news. The Bible says that God loves you and he created you to be in a life-giving relationship with him, to truly know him, not just to know that he's forgiving and kind and holy and big, but to know him and be known by him. You know, sports is great, but it can never fill the hole in the soul. Money is useful, but it can never fill the hole in the soul. Fame can never fill the hole in the soul. Coach, after you're, you, you'd win the Rose Bowl, you'd talk about it for the next year, but I can remember you saying, okay, 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 enough to talk about the Rose Bowl. Everybody wants to talk about that, but you, you know there was more to it. And because you knew that that wasn't the end goal, it never could fill the hole in the soul. So God created us to know him personally. But the kindest act of love that God could really do is to tell us what we need to hear and not what we necessarily want to hear. Just like you want your doctor to be honest with you. The Bible tells us that we are filled with the very thing that separates us from God. And that's what the Bible calls sin. It's the wrongs that I do. It's the thoughts of the independent Phil that wants to be ruler of his own world. That's what sin is. 
I can try to look the part and do good things. I could try to erase my sin. But it's like that stain that you get on that new shirt that you can't get out. I can't erase my nature. So the Bible says that he offers a relationship, but, the, but my sin separates me from God. But the great news is that Jesus Christ is God's only provision, his only solution for our sin. And it's through him alone that we can know God personally, experience his love, and that life-giving relationship. When he died on the cross, he wasn't just creating a Hallmark card or a necklace. He took every thought, every action in my past, in yours, and in my future, and in your future, and he took the full punishment that I deserved for my sin. He took it for me so that my debt could actually be paid. Many of us have heard that forever, but we need to be fresh in a new way to see that, wow, you have done that for me, Lord. Why did you do that? And he says, because you can never, ever pay the debt yourself. Phil, <laughs> you're more jacked up than you know. Phil, even your good things, the motives that you do, your good things are jacked up, right? The Bible says that it's not enough, though, just to know that. We live in a state where there's two peninsulas. There's the Big Mac that connects them. Just because you and I are in the southern peninsula, downstate, as they say, and because a Big Mac bridge exists, doesn't mean we're in the UP. Those of you from the UP are getting my analogy. You're thinking, yes, it's a little like heaven, right? God's country. God's country. <laughs> Just because there's a bridge doesn't mean I'm there. Just because Jesus died for my sin doesn't mean that that's applied to my life. Uh, the football team in July, I believe it is, they would get what they call Nike Christmas. That's when you'd get all your gear. It's like, ooh, the Nike gear. And the equipment manager would give that gear. And as I observe that, I think, you know what? Sometimes I feel like Jesus is like the equipment manager or he's the salvation fairy. It's his job to forgive me. That's what he does, right? I mess up forgiveness, right? But he doesn't have to. And just because it's offered doesn't mean I have it. And so finally, the Bible talks about, I love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, for it's by God's undeserved kindness, his grace, that we can be saved or rescued from our sin through faith alone in Christ. Not as a result of my attempts or my works or my resume, but because of what he has done for me. Saving faith real saving faith. You know what you really believe in life. What you really believe in life, saving faith is, is, is a turning away from trusting in what I can do, trusting in what I can do to merit salvation or myself. That's called repentance and turning to God and truly trusting him and what he accomplished for my salvation, not so that I could be my own savior. If you would like to make this decision today, if you've never done this in your life, you can have a relationship with Christ today by placing your trust in what he did for you, by expressing your faith in prayer to God. Prayer, prayer doesn't save you. Uh, we live in a formulaic world. Just give me the answer. Give me the, give me the equation, right? Saying words doesn't save anybody. But the words I want to share with you, if that truly expresses the desire of your heart in who you are, where you're at as a person, the Bible says that Jesus wants to enter your life today. So I'd like to pray for us, lead you in a prayer that you can make your own, if that's where you're at. So if you bow your head with me, let's pray. Lord, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for your kindness to us. You are a pursuing God. You don't just wait. You don't just raise the bar so high that we can never make it. You do something about it. Father, I, I think of my friends here in the room. Many of us truly have a personal relationship with you. But I know, Father, that daily I need a fresh and a new to see you for who you are and to surrender my life to you. 
You're a much better shepherd than I am. We're just sheep. So I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would, they would do that today, that we would resolve in our heart to live for you, Jesus, not because it makes you like us more or gets us salvation, but because of what you've done on the cross. And now, Father, for my friends who may not know if they have a personal relationship with you or are unsure, Father, thank you for what you've done. And so, friends, if you're in that spot today, I want to invite you to express this to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I truly want to know you personally. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I open up the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life. Make me the person that you want me to be. Amen.